Okay, so in this video I'm going to go over various different types of proofs as a follow-up to the introduction proof videos I did previously. Um, this one is going to go over four different types of proofs. One we've technically gone over but didn't go over it by name and implication of what it is. And then the others are kind of an alteration of that. So let's go ahead and just hop on over to it. Yeah, so just various types of proofs. There's like four different kinds. So proofs, proofs, and more proofs. So during this, we're going to go over the idea of direct proofs, proof by contrapositive, proof by contradictions, and then proof by cases. We already did proof by exhaustion in the previous lecture. Uh, so if you want to look at that, you can go watch the other one. But that's kind of all five proofs that we're going to go over in this course. Direct proofs being the most straightforward. So many mathematical theorems will take on the form of a conditional statement in which a conclusion follows from a set of hypotheses. So in this case, we have hypothesis P implies C. It's very direct. And it's named direct proof. So the hypothesis P is assumed to be true and the conclusion C is proven as a direct result of the assumption. So start with your assumption. The square of every odd integer is also odd. So let's do three. 3 squared equals 9. Well, that's odd. Uh, 5 squared, 25. It's also odd. And 13 squared, 169. Also odd. So, seems pretty consistent. Now, name a generic object and what will be proven. Let n be an integer that is odd. That's what we did. We'll take 3. And then we want to show that n squared is also odd. 3 squared equals 9. That's exactly what we did. But obviously that's not enough. So what we can do is we can start with a theorem here. The square of every odd integer is also odd. Another way to say that is if n is an odd integer, then n squared is an odd integer. And this is a little bit better of what so you're saying it. n is an odd integer, n squared is an odd integer. So we have our definitive hypothesis, n is an odd integer, and then our conclusion, n squared is an odd integer. So they both, at the end of the day, should be odd integers. So, arbitrary object in the domain and state an assumption based on the object. You have a very, very easy to use arbitrary object. We're gonna do n equals 2k plus one because it is the mathematical definition for what an odd integer is. So it will be true for every single odd integer you can possibly use based on the actual mathematical definition. So it's always true. So, plug n equals 2k plus 1 into n squared to get our actual result we want to get. So, we have n squared equals 2k plus 1 squared. Do a little bit of algebra. We end up with 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. We're going to factor out a 2. And we end up with the form of 2 times 2k squared plus 2k plus 1. Now, the form of this should look fairly familiar. And the reason is since k is an integer, 2k squared plus 2k is also an integer. So we can just substitute this as m and say that m is an integer. So since n squared equals 2m plus 1, or m equals our previous thing here, we end up with the form of 2m plus 1. That m being an integer makes it the same as the original 2k plus 1, therefore n squared must be odd. So that's it. It's been proven true using just a basic mathematical definition and a little bit of algebra. So similarly we have proof by contrapositive. It proves a conditional statement of the form p implies c by showing that the contrapositive negated c implies negated p it's true, and that's because these two are logically equivalent. So in other words, negated C is assumed to be true, and negated P is proven as a result of the negated C. So we kind of work backwards. We assume a negation of the conclusion, and we want to show a negation of the hypothesis. So in this case, if 3n plus 7 is an odd integer, then n is an even integer. So you assume that n is odd, because it can't be even, Strictly because it is under proof by contrapositive, we assume the opposite. 
So again, we're going to use 2k or nk plus 1. I'm oh, sorry, n equals 2k plus 1. My bad. So plugging in n equals 2k plus 1 into 3n plus 7 gives us the form of 3 times 2k plus 1 plus 7. So a little bit of algebra, 6k plus 3 plus 7, 6k plus 10, we end up with a form of 2 times 3k plus 5. That should look a little bit familiar because since k is an integer, 3k plus 5 is also an integer. Therefore, 3n plus 7 is equal to 2 times an integer. So 3n plus 7 must be an even integer. Now, the reason why in these previous two examples we have, say, this is also an integer is because we know that k is. Multiplication will not change the form of the value. It will be a, an integer times an integer will always be an integer just based on the operation. Same with addition. Same thing would happen with subtraction. No matter what you do, you will never end up with a floating point value. Now if de uh, division comes into play, then things will change and you'll have to pay more attention. But in terms of what we're doing of addition and multiplication and maybe subtraction, that will never change the stance of an integer. And since we know that three is an integer, five is an integer, and k is an integer, the result will also be an integer. So it doesn't matter what we get. We just know for a fact the result will be an integer. And then it also complies with two times an integer, which is the mathematical definition of even numbers. So it's proved by contrapositive. Proof by contradiction, or contradiction, my bad, is a little bit different. We should start by assuming that the theorem is false and it shows that some logical inconsistency arises as a result of the assumption. This is also known as an indirect proof. So, since we might have some issue where, say, going straight from the theorem to the conclusion is very, very difficult, maybe if we assume the opposite of our hypothesis, so in this case our negated theorem, and we fail to prove the negation of our theorem, that inconsistency must mean that the original theorem has to be true. Because basically we start with negated p and we get to false. That must just mean that normal p has to be true based on our contradiction. Now, example here is they have for every pair of positive integers a and b square root of a plus the square root of b is not equal to the square root of a plus b so keep in mind that it is positive integers so a is greater than zero b is greater than zero and since it's contradiction we have the square root of a plus the square root of b is equal to the square root of a plus b this is what we're trying to prove based on this so in this case we just square both sides uh, there's a, there's gonna be a lot of just really small meticulous math going on here. So square both sides gives us this. Go through this process, so we end up with a form of a plus two times the square root of a times b plus b equals a plus b. Again, don't get too lost in the actual algebra here. It's not extremely important. So we subtract a and b from both sides. This gets rid of these two, which leads with the form of two times the square root of a times b. We are going to divide by two, which gives us the form of a times b equals zero. Now, since a times b equals zero, a will have to be zero, or b will have to be zero, in order for us to get a true value. It cannot be zero, neither of them can be zero, because we're dealing strictly with positive integers. A and B must be greater than zero. So this is a logical inconsistency. It will never be true. There will never be an instance where the contradiction will be true. Therefore, the original must be true because the contradiction will always be false. Now moving on, we have proof by cases. I personally like proof by cases. I think it's pretty fun. As fun as proofs can get, obviously, but I digress. 
So many theorems can be phrased as the universal x p of x, where the value of variable x can be any element from some domain. A proof by cases of a universal, universal statement, such as universal x p of x, breaks the domain for the variable x into different classes and gives different proofs for each class. So if we have one direct proof on a infinite domain, if we know a way to break that domain down into cases that will encompass every possible value in the domain, then we can generate multiple proofs based on those cases. A perfect example of that is being given for every integer x. x squared minus x is an even integer. So what we know is that we are trying to deal with every single integer. Well, we know multiple types of integers. We know how to do with prime and composite. But more importantly, we know how to deal with even and odd. And we have specific definitions for those that we can plug in. So we're going to have two cases. X is odd or X is even. This will cover all integers. So case one, X is even. Since x is even, x equals 2 times k for some integer k. Plugging in 2k for x and x squared minus x, we get x squared minus x equals 2k squared minus 2k. For plugging in 2k for it, gives us the form of 4k squared minus 2k, which we can then factor out 2 and get the form of 2 times 2k squared minus k. Again, we just have multiplication. Exponent's not going to change anything. Subtraction isn't going to change anything. So this must also be an integer. Therefore, we have 2 times an integer, which is guaranteed to be even. So this case, true. So halfway there. Case 2, x is odd. So since x is odd, x equals 2k plus 1 for some integer k. Plugging in 2k plus 1, we get some more jargony math. We end up with x squared plus x. Now is 2k plus 1 squared minus 2k plus 1, which gives us the form of 4k squared plus 4k plus 1 minus 2k plus 1. Cancel these out. We know the form of 4k squared plus 2k. Factor out our 2, and we end up with 2 times 2k squared plus k. No division happening, just addition, multiplication, and exponents. That will not change it being an integer. Therefore, 2k squared plus k is an integer. Therefore, we end up with 2 times an integer which is even. So this case is also proven. So since both cases are proven, it encompasses all even integers and also all odd integers. Therefore, that proves every integer. Therefore, the original proof must be true. And so that's pretty much it. I mean, that's four different types of proofs. We have direct proofs. We have proof by contrapositive. We have proof by contradiction. We have proof by cases. In the previous video, we have proof by exhaustion. So it's just lots of different ways to end up with a proof. Because again, going for a direct proof, just straight from the hypothesis to the theorem, it may not always be straightforward. It may not always be a clear way to get from point A to point B. So if we use logical equivalency and just some other jargon and some mathematical definitions and a little bit of intelligence and cleverness, you can end up proving a lot of things, even if it's not during the actual intended direct method. So hopefully that makes all sense, and hope you learned something, and I'll see you guys in the next video.